Good morning. This is Pentecost Sunday, and uh, we are wrapping up, since this is the 31st of May, we're wrapping up this quarter's lessons. Um, we've talked about uh, this quarter, uh, God with us, about who Jesus was, his birth, um, how he was completely submitted at 12 years old, how he was wanted to be about his father's business. Um, we talked about his baptism, uh, his uh his uh, temptation in the wilderness. It is written, it is written. Um, follow me, where he called his disciples. Um, then uh, the Lord's Prayer, the disciples' prayer, how to pray. We talked about um, how he talked, he talked about building your house on the rock, having a firm foundation, um, having good soil. Um, then we talked about the Lord's Supper. Uh, we talked about the Gethsemane, the prayer in Gethsemane. We talked about the sacrifice, uh, Calvary, um, the crucifixion, and then last week was the resurrection. So this week we're continuing. This is the last in the in the, se in the season here. For the 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 theme of this quarter was sharing his mission. So the thing is that we are commanded to share the gospel message with everyone. So I want to start reading in Matthew, the 28th chapter, verses 16 to 20. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Uh, the Amplified, and I think the New King James or the NIV or whatever also says, Make disciples instead of teach. Um baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Now, if you diagram that out as a, as a sentence, you'll see that you're supposed to baptize in the name, the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, which was Jesus. Jesus said, I'm come in my Father's name. He said he would send the Holy Ghost back in his name. Uh, Jesus is the only name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, according to Acts 4 and 12. So, then it says in verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. And we'll talk about that toward the end here. And he says, Amen. And this was the end of, end of Matthew's. And Mark 16, 15 to 16, he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 46 and 47, he said, And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And we can restructure this sentence to actually get more meaning out of it, that repentance and remission of sins in his name should be preached among all nations. He wasn't saying go preach remission of sins in my name. He was saying, preach remission of sins in my name. So we know that uh, in Acts 2 and 38, that uh, Peter told them in the plan of salvation to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins. And that is how your sins are remitted. So that is how that works. Then he said, beginning at Jerusalem. And then in Acts 1 and 8, again, Luke's, Luke's uh, rendering of this, this time uh, just before Jesus uh, ascended. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, locally, Judea, a little further out, Samaria, a little further out, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So what he was saying was you take this message and you're going to be witnesses unto me all the way around the world. And so we're, we're talking about um, sharing his mission. And not all mission statements are created equal. Um, corporate bigwigs hire other bigwigs to brainstorm around a conference room table and, and devise the perfect um, little pithy mission statement for their company. And it'll be marching orders. The marching orders that the, that how that the, um, the company does business by. Now, some are excellent, and some could use a little work. Avon's mission statement 
about 249 words and includes six core aspirations. So we're looking at about maybe 229 words too long. Albertsons exists, quote, to create a shopping experience that pleases our customers, a workplace that creates opportunities and a great working environment for our associates, and a business that achieves financial success. Now, the, their word count is a little better, but those 29 words don't tell us if Albertsons sells tires or oil or drinking straws or, you know, manufacturers, whatever, but Albertsons is a grocery store chain. Jesus would have made the big wigs proud. His mission is his mission statement is real specific. It's short, it's easy to remember. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's that's pretty direct. His mission statement tells us to go everywhere and tell everyone. He doesn't tell us to sort them out. He doesn't tell us to pick and choose. He just says to go and tell. He's called us to go into all the world and make disciples. So the next time you wonder what God created you to do, remember these short verses at the end of the Gospels. Go and make disciples. Jesus gave his life to give his church this mission. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, according to Luke 19 and 10. Now Jesus came to bring reconciliation to God and man. In 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 to 21, it says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, behold, all things have become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imparting their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray that as in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So this mission of Jesus motivated everything he did. It was his father's business, as we, we learned about about three months ago in uh, when he was 12 years old, I must be about my father's business. The Bible is clear that the lost were never far from the mind of Jesus. He didn't come for popularity. Um, he didn't come to establish an earthly kingdom or to live in luxury. He came to save the lost. But how was Jesus going to achieve the seeking and the saving? The Bible indicates that Jesus knew uh, that to achieve his mission, he would have to suffer and die on the cross. If you want to read John 2, verses 19 to 22, he, he knew what this was about. He knew why he was here. This opened the door for anyone anywhere to be saved. On the cross, Jesus fulfilled the righteous requirements of the law, according to Ephesians 2, verses 14 to 16. We're not going to read those. In Colossians 2, verses 13 to 14. And to use a common analogy, this the cross is the bridge over the chasm between us and God. But to carry that analogy one step further, we don't have the power to walk over the bridge. To walk the chasm that's bridged by the cross, we have to have power. And this is where the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, um, impacts us. Now, John the Baptist prophesied that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Ghost. And as a connecting prophet between the Old and New Testaments, John the Baptist connected the message of God's prophets to the backslidden nation of Israel with the ministry of Jesus. His ministry was to preach repentance and to baptize those who responded to the call of God on their hearts. He said, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. And this, this was not a complete plan of salvation as we know it today because we know in, in uh, Acts 19 that Paul found some of John's converts and rebaptized them in the name of Jesus because when he asked them how were they baptized, it said John's baptism. And he said, Well, John barely baptized with a baptism under repentance. He says, saying that you should believe on him which should come after him. And he preached unto them Jesus, and they were rebaptized in the name of Jesus. So um, traditionally, baptism was only for Gentiles who uh, wanted to uh, convert to Judaism. But John also called the Jews to be baptized to show their commitment to God. 
But John's ministry was well received by the people. While it seems clear the religious leaders um, held him at a skeptic's distance. It's like, well, I don't know about this guy. He's a little weird. He dresses funny. Uh, this, this stuff that he's preaching, I don't know. Um, it's kind of like people we have today. You know, we uh, a church is in a town of people. Well, I don't know if I really like that, but they notice that all the people that go there, their lives are changed. They're they're doing better. They're becoming productive in society. They're becoming great people, and everything. So they, well, I don't know that I really want to accept it, but I can't really argue with the results. But John proclaimed that his ministry is one of preparation, in John one and twenty three. So the necessary and needed preparation was repentance. But John's message was twofold. The first emphasis was repentance. But repentance was necessary because the one coming after John, as uh, John said, he was going to baptize them with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So this baptism converted disciples and initiated them into the, the body of, of Christ. This was the power that enabled them to cross that bridge provided by the cross. So we can, we can see from Scripture that Jesus came with what mission in mind? That was to seek and save the lost. Now, I do know that what was lost originally when man sinned was that communion with God. And he did come to restore that communion. But because we were lost, I mean, we were, because of sin, we were basically uh, condemned to suffer for eternity for violating God's law. But he came in flesh to provide the sacrifice so that we didn't have to. So this, this is also the lost that he came to save. So who were the lost that Jesus came to save? Everyone. Romans 3 and 23, Paul said, all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. But how was Jesus going to save everyone? By accepting their repentance and then baptizing them with the Holy Spirit. Now, this, this message of baptism in the Holy Ghost was so important that we see Jesus proclaim to the disciples that he will baptize them with the Holy Ghost in Acts 1 and 5. And then later in Acts 11 and 16, Peter retold what happened at the home of Cornelius. Um, and he said that um, he was still talking to them and preaching to them, and the Holy Ghost fell on them. And he said, then he was recounting this to the Jews back there because they were kind of condemning him for going into a Gentile's house. And he said, when all this happened, he said, then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. So the context of this account in Acts 11 is Peter explaining to, in Jerusalem what happened in Caesarea at, at his house. So he explained that while he was still speaking to them, the Holy Spirit fell on them. They began to speak with tongues. So we, we can kind of imagine that Peter was uh, somewhat bewildered that God had poured out the Holy Ghost on Gentiles just as he had the Jews. Now, I don't know what he was expecting when he went to the Gentiles' house who said, an angel appeared to me, said to send for you, and you would tell me what to do. Um, I don't know what he was expecting when he, when he talked to him and told him what to do. But these, when, when he was considering all this, the words of Jesus illuminated his mind. And then um, this, this is where we get back to chapter, to verse 16. We said, Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Jesus wasn't limiting his, his seeking and saving just to the Jews. Uh, the Bible says that he came to his own, his own received him not. So by Cornelius and his household being filled with, with the Holy Ghost, the disciples learned the mission of Jesus was to reach everyone. Now they may have at first said, well, this is what you have to do. And this is, you know, Jesus died and he, he rose again. And this, he, he died to save us from our sins and, and all of this. How does that apply to me? Well, Jesus sealed that by filling them with his spirit. And when he did that, it's like, okay, well, this, if God's accepted them, we can't really reject him. So he achieved his mission through the cross and by baptizing with the Holy Ghost. So um, this is how the mission of Jesus is fulfilled. When someone obeys the gospel through repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. 
Just as easy as one, two, three, or A, B, C, however you want to do it. In Luke 14, verses 16 to 22, there's that record there of a day that Jesus went to a synagogue in Nazareth on the Sabbath. Uh, Bible scholars are unsure of when the synagogue became prominent in, in, uh, in Judaism, but it's clear that by the time by the time of Jesus, it was accepted. It was an accepted form of, of covenant continuity and worship. Now, as the Jewish people um, became subjects of other nations and weren't able to practice worship as freely as, as they did at the temple, synagogues became important. Uh, Jesus went to a synagogue as a boy. Some scholars uh, think that he attended the same one as a child. Uh, that he went to, uh, that we that we read about here in Luke four in uh, chapter four. Now it's possible the local synagogue leaders invited Jesus to read and to preach, or it's possible that Jesus just let them know his desire to read that day by standing up to read. And Luke four and sixteen. Um, well, you can read that. We'll, we'll go on to seventeen in a minute. But whether he was invited to speak or he took the initiative himself. One thing is clear, when the law or prophets were read, the reader would stand, and then after reading, it was customary for the speaker to sit down while teaching or preaching. This is kind of like we do in church sometimes, you know, with, we, we stand for the reading of the text, and then we sit down to, to, to listen to the explanations and, and the uh, affirmations and, and everything about, about what was just read. But this is what Jesus did. Luke 4 and 17 says, And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. When he'd opened the book, he found the place where it was written. Now, some suggest that the synagogue was ordered according to a lectionary calendar, and this particular reading was the reading assigned for the day when Jesus arrived. But the wording of the text seems to indicate this is not the case. Luke says that Jesus found the place where it was written. So, I don't know if there was some divine intervention here that caused him to give him the book of Isaiah, but uh, he was he was prepared. Um, this is, uh, you know, the Bible talks about being instant in season, out of season. Jesus was instant in season, out of season. Um, give it to me. I'm going to read from this, and then he goes. So he stood up and he read from Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2, where the prophet prophesied about the coming Messiah and his anointing. It said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now Jesus referred here to his anointing that occurred at his baptism. In his ministry, Jesus was an anointed man of God. Now it seems clear that Jesus understood his anointing by God as power for his ministry. But Jesus is unique because all the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. This is what Colossians 2 and 9 says. But as a man, he needed the anointing of God to accomplish his ministry. Now, from a human perspective, this might seem unnecessary. After all, Jesus is fully man and fully God. So why would he need anointing from God to perform his ministry? Couldn't he just simply do it as the mighty God in Christ? Well, he could have done it that way, but that wouldn't have been consistent with the incarnation. God created Jesus as both fully human and fully divine. Uh, one example is the way Jesus helped John the Baptist understand the importance of uh, him being baptized. He was baptized not because of sin, but as it says in Matthew 3 and 15, to fulfill all righteousness. So in a similar way, Jesus as a man was anointed by God to perform his ministry. Now, this, this is an example to us as believers, and, that, and that's the point. Uh, sometimes you may, you may find when you're witnessing to someone or talking to someone about God that you, you start feeling the anointing of God helping you and bringing scriptures to you and, and giving you words to say. But Jesus told the crowd that day that he was God's anointed one to do the work of the kingdom. And then he, he also said that that scripture was filled today in their hearing. And so by this, Jesus indicated that the long wait for the Messiah was over. He was there preaching to the poor, healing the brokenhearted, proclaiming liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind. All these things were now available. Now, disciples of Jesus have to know that to be effective in the work of reaching the lost, the anointing of God is essential. Otherwise, you're just, you're just out there trying to get people to join a club. 
But if, if Jesus needed the anointing to be effective, then obviously his followers do as well. The good news is that God anoints his people to be effective at, at reaching the lost. Anointing doesn't come to, to build a human kingdom or elevate a personality. It comes when someone lifts up the name of Jesus and tells a lost soul about the salvation provided by God. So, we mentioned at the beginning of the lesson the mission of Jesus was seeking and saving. So let, let's look a little more at the specifics of this mission. First, Jesus sought the lost. One effective way to understand this is by the contrast that Jesus illustrates of himself versus the Pharisees. The Pharisees in the time of Jesus layered the law of Moses with, with a lot of additional human traditions and put burdens on people that they weren't capable of fulfilling. And this is what it says in Matthew 23, verses 4 and in 13. But it, when he, in the uh, same chapter there in verse 23, Jesus was telling that by, by neglecting the weightier matters of the law, the Pharisees had further corrupted themselves. Jesus affirmed that they should have kept the law, but it was their addition to it that prohibited themselves and others from doing so. Worse, their oral traditions... Um, allowed them to disassociate them to dis dissociate themselves from anybody who didn't measure up to their false views. So they had little regard for the lost. If you were not in their elite clique, then you were just beneath them, and you just didn't really matter. Uh, people like Zacchaeus, the woman at the well, the woman who washed Jesus' feet with her tears, those people were excluded and, and uh, avoided according to the false notions of the, of the Pharisees. Those people were not to be you know, considered they were they were sinners. The publican that was um, that was praying uh, at the same time as the Pharisee. And Jesus said he went home more justified than the Pharisee did because the Pharisee was just over there bragging about how good he was rather than actually praying. So the kingdom, according to the Pharisees, wasn't wasn't open to them. They were lost, but Jesus sought them sought them out. Examples fill the Gospels proving that Jesus sought the lost. Maybe one of the, the greatest scriptural illustrations of this is Luke 15, where you see the story of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. Now, in each story, something of value is lost, and someone searches for it. Uh, the searchers in the stories are the woman, the shepherd, and the father. Each one looks diligently and longingly for the lost. But at the end of each of these stories, Jesus says those who found the missing items rejoiced and celebrated. Um... Verses 7 and 10 tell, tell us that there is joy in heaven when just one repents. Jesus not only seeks, but he has the power to save. When you look at the story of the lost son from Luke 15, consider that the lost son is different from the other two lost items that precede his story in the chapter. Aggressive searches take place for the lost sheep and the lost coin, but little is told about the coin and the sheep. Now, the coin was lost. The coin didn't know it was lost. And the coin had no way of saving itself. So somebody had to hunt hunt it down. Uh, the sheep was lost. The sheep knew it was lost, but didn't know what to do about it. So the shepherd had to go and find the sheep. But in the case of the lost son, the lost son was lost because he chose to be lost. He had made a decision. He'd made a bad decision. And he knew what to do about it. So you can't really look at it and say, well somebody should have gone looking for him. Now, I've heard some, some preach that that wasn't the father's place. That was a brother's place to go find his brother. But uh, regardless, he knew where he left. He knew where to go. He knew how to get back. And when he finally hit bottom, came to himself, he went back to his father's house. And the, the story of the son, it, a lot is told about him about his rejection, his running away from the father's house, his realization that he was wrong. These are all key elements of the story. <coughs> but he has volition. He has to make a choice to return to the father's house. Once his choice is made and he is no longer fit to be a son but only a servant, um, the focus of the narrative shifts from him back to the father. It's then when he comes back that the father runs to him, restores him, and rejoices with him. The Father had the power to save. Uh, the Father, in this case, represents God. And Jesus was telling his hearers that God has, has the power to save even lost sons. We know that God performed his saving power 
in the man Christ Jesus. His atoning death on the cross and subsequent outpouring of his spirit on those who repent uh, tells the tale. He runs to, he restores and rejoices with everyone who repents and are baptized in his name and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Jesus seeks and saves the lost. So Jesus came to seek and save the lost and our mission is the same. In our lesson text, Jesus explained the components of our mission and the task we need to perform to do it effectively. Before looking deeply at these passages, let's look at missions and mission statements. Business management uh, experts have, have cautioned that not having mission statement clarity can sidetrack an inter enterprise. While the church is certainly more important than any business enterprise, it's still beneficial for churches to have a mission statement that derives from Jesus' mission of seeking and saving the lost. One writer, Aubrey Malfers, in Ministry Nuts and Bolts, described a mission this way, a broad, brief biblical statement of what the organization is supposed to be doing. A mission isn't a vision. Um, it's not a purpose statement. Mission describes what the church is doing. Uh, a mission statement should be concise enough, according to Malfers, to fit on a t-shirt. <coughs> not in tiny reading uh, writing where you have to follow the person around to see what it says. But Jesus commanded the disciples to go. A seemingly simple command, uh, but one that even they were challenged to fulfill. A lot of people have noticed it was a persecution of the church in the book of Acts that propelled it beyond the walls of Jerusalem. In Acts 11 and 17, it says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phenis and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none other but unto the Jews only. Of course, this was this was while they were still having a little issue with Gentiles and, and stuff. But going can be challenging. Um, I will say, though, that here it we talked about the different ones that were preaching in Antioch. They did preach uh, to a lot of the Greeks, and a lot of the Greeks accepted this and, uh, and came into the church. But one writer said it this way, the start stops most. The start stops most. In other words, getting started is what stops most people. It's not that things are too hard. It's not that things are, are too lofty and, and just unreachable. It's just that I, I don't want to make that commitment or that first step to, to make this happen. I saw a meme somewhere that said, you can't be committed to your dream and your comfort zone at the same time. And you can't be committed to Jesus' mission and your comfort zone at the same time. How true that is, but the command is still to go. The disciples faced obstacles to going. Uh, initially, the Romans regarded them as a sect of Judaism and treated them in similar ways, but the disciples faced persecution from the Jews very early on. I mean, it wasn't the Romans that stoned Stephen. Eventually, the Romans persecuted the church as well. The threat of persecution was a significant obstacle, but the leaders of the church weren't discouraged. It didn't stop them. Um, after they were persecuted and told, you don't preach this anymore, they went back and, and prayed for more boldness and were thankful that they were able to, to be in this capacity that God would allow them to be persecuted and, and, and cast down or whatever you want to call it for his name. But they received the mission from Jesus and they moved forward in faith. Uh, we, we too have obstacles. Uh, the church will always be opposed by the world, by the flesh and by the devil. But the command is the same as it was to them. It still go. When disciples focus on the challenges, they lose faith. But when they focus on God's word, they're invigorated. Yeah, one of the things that read in Brother um, Brother Willoughby's book about the restricted zone, he said that when he shared his vision for Singapore, people gave to the mission. They gave to support the work. When he just talked about the need this needs to be done and we need to do this we need to do that people just look at his need and their need and said you know well I, I i wish i could help you out more that this is all i can do but when he shared his vision and he shared the dream he had um just like sharing this mission here it it invigorates people and say i want to be a part of that i want to give i want to make this happen and that's how we need to look at the mission that jesus left here so going is essential um, what's done as a person goes is just as important as going. 
I remember in, in the uh, in the Old Testament when there was a um, there was a big fight going on. This is when uh, Absalom had revolted against David, and uh, Joab was out in the battle, and all this was going on, and and um, he he sent he sent uh, I think it might have been his brother I don't remember, but he sent he sent a runner to go back and tell David the results and what had happened with the war. And um, another guy was there, and he said, he's, I'm, I'm a faster runner. He said, let me go, let me go, let me go. And he says, no, he says, you, you can go another time, another day. But right now, he, he's got the message, and he's going to go. Well, I, I, let me go, let me go. Finally, he goes, okay, run. But he took off. He passed the other guy. He got there first, come running up to David, and David said, well, what happened? Well, I don't know, but I saw a great tumult. Well, that was a big help. He says, would you stand by over here? Let's see what the man, next man has to say. The other one came with the, with the message. What had happened, the results, the, 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 uh, the enemy had been defeated, and actually David's son had been killed. But sometimes, you know, it's, it's just as important to have something when you get where you're going than it is to actually go. The disciples left Jerusalem. They proclaimed the gospel. They didn't have beautiful church buildings where they could gather. They didn't sing worship songs and proclaim the word of God in a, in a, in a building like, like we have in, in, uh, in this day and age. Um, they simply told people that Jesus died, was buried, rose again the third day, and let people know what they had to do to make it to heaven. You look at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 to 4. This is, this is what we're supposed to be telling people about, about Jesus. The first church met in homes for worship and preaching, but their, their preaching of the gospel also took place in a lot of other locations. In Acts 16 and 13, Luke wrote that on the Sabbath day, they went out of the city of Philippi by Riverside. And this is where Lydia, the seller of purple, this is where she was converted. In Acts 17 and 22, Paul preached on Mars Hill in Athens, the Um they, they just preached wherever they could. So the disciples lived in a world with, with many religions. Their world was pluralistic. Various religions were celebrated, but None claimed preeminence. Everybody just kind of, it was the, you know, tolerate everybody else type of thing until it came to Christianity, and then everybody was like, oh, you can't do that. Kind of like some of people are doing today. But theirs was a deeply immoral society with little or no sense of decency, kind of like where our culture seems to be headed right now. Immorality was publicly displayed in practice as well as the worship of idols. But still, the disciples preached the gospel. They told the good news of Jesus and God confirmed his word. For those whose temperaments are introverted, preaching the gospel can, can be challenging. Some should just practicing telling what the Lord has done for you. Uh, practice telling your, your testimony of what God's done in your life to others, others in the church and uh, so that you're comfortable with talking about it. It's also helpful to recognize that preaching the gospel happens not only behind a pulpit, but also over a dinner table or at a restaurant, on a break at work, at the grocery store, on a walk through the neighborhood, at a service station, a lot of other places. Many excuse themselves from this task because they aren't preachers, but God calls all his people to tell his gospel. Some decline. Uh, uh, they decline the offer of telling the good news out of a sense of political correctness. After all, some say politics and religion are the two things that people in a polite society are not supposed to discuss. Who said that? Certainly there are some significant challenges for people who work in secular employment. And no matter how well-intentioned your, your, uh, your motives are, people feel that telling someone they need Jesus creates a hostile work environment. <laughs> the one helpful principle is understanding that the gospel of Jesus is the gospel of peace. In Ephesians 6 and 15, Paul taught the Ephesian church that part of the whole armor of God was having their feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The gospel doesn't bring conflict to people. It does bring separation. It uh, Holiness brings separation. But sin brings separation. Conflict comes from the sinfulness of the human heart and the evil of the adversary. But the gospel brings peace. A lot of these things you have to look at in context. People have some distorted ways of looking at things and uh, twisting things around to make it look like you did something bad when you did something good. Uh, God rebukes that in his word. But 
realizing we offer peace through the gospel can, can greatly encourage us to tell God's good news. Through the gospel, disciples offer peace with God. To someone stuck in the turmoil of sin, nothing can be greater. The main problem is that most people don't accept that their answer is Jesus or that their answer is the, the gospel of peace, Jesus' gospel of peace and the death, burial, resurrection, how to get to heaven. Uh, a lot of people just think, well, it's, that's just another, it's just another religion, but that's not the case. But Jesus commanded the, his disciples to baptize in his name. Mark 16 and 16, again, we, we have this in our, in our text. At the beginning, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Baptism is an essential part of salvation. Repentance and water baptism together complete the full work of forgiveness. You can repent, you can turn away from your ways and everything, but until you are baptized in the name of Jesus, and that is how the blood from his sacrifice is applied to your life, this is where you come in blood covenant with Jesus. Until that is done, your sins have not been remitted. They have not been covered up and done away with. They are just forgiven, but the blot is still on your record. Baptism has a lot of scriptural purposes, though there's no scriptural record of baptism for the purpose of public confession. Romans 6 and 4 says that we're buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Um, baptism uh, serves as a spiritual circumcision of the heart. Uh, the blood, the blood uh, covenant that the Jews had with Christ or with, with, with God in the Old Testament was, was a circumcision. In Colossians 2, 11 to 12, baptism does that. Now, Jesus commanded his disciples to baptize, and they obeyed. Um, remember that baptism is not works. Baptism is obedience. God tells you to do something. You can't just say, well, that'd be works, so I can't do it because I'm not saved by works. Well, you're saved by obedience. If you're not going to obey God, you're not going to make it. It's just impossible to, to do that. Disciples of Jesus today will baptize those who desire to be saved from their sins. Churches fulfilling the mission of Jesus are baptizing people just like the apostles did in the book of Acts, by submersion and in the name of Jesus. Sprinkling is not baptism. It's sprinkling. Baptism from baptizo means to cover, to immerse, to bury. So you can't do that with a few sprinkles of water or dribbling some or smearing some on. That's just not going to get the work done. If we're buried with him, baptism, then we need to be buried in water in Jesus' name. Now, through his earthly ministry, Jesus gave the pattern. Now the disciples, too, were responsible to, to spread his love and grow his kingdom. In Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20, Jesus told the disciples that all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth had been given to him. This is further proof that he would enable them to fulfill the task and no obstacle could stop them. Now, when commissioning them to go, Jesus told them to go and teach because all authority belonged to him. You go back and read, those, read all those verses together. The disciples weren't going forth to teach and make disciples in their own authority. They went on Jesus' authority. Uh, they were commanded to teach, make disciples, and baptize because all authority belonged to Jesus. Now, one of the overlooked uh, passages or portions of this passage is, is that final clause of Matthew 28 and 20. Jesus said, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, most Christians want the presence of God and even claim it as a promise from the Bible, but it's important to note the context of Scripture here, just like in a lot of other places, when the promise of God's presence is given here. Um, for example, God promised Moses he would be with him in Exodus 3, but that promise uh, of presence was contingent on Moses doing what God was calling him to do. And this passage is very similar. God conveys his abiding presence to those who abide in him and do his will. So those that claim to follow him but don't abide in him or do his will can't really expect God to be with them in the same way that he is with those who are actually abiding in him and doing his will. Churches do a lot of things, and a lot of those things are, are very important. Uh, feeding, feeding the hungry and, and doing those things are great, but 
you could have a full stomach and still go to hell. So it, the most important thing that we can do for people is, is never lose sight of the truth that our reason for existence is to glorify God and make disciples. People can have a lot of things and still not make it to heaven. So we need to, we need to concentrate on, as Brother Woodward says, the good part. We, we've got to get people to the point where they have a relationship with Jesus. So let's not become sidetracked or distracted with the, with the cares of this life and lose our commitment to our, our true purpose and mission. If Jesus came to seek and save the lost, as his disciples, we're called to do the same. We have that same ministry of reconciliation, reconciling the world to Jesus. Now, starting next week, we're going to be starting a new series on God is Faithful. Um, some people can't be counted on. Maybe that's why it's refreshing to find people who, who actually do what they say they'll do. But if we're honest with ourselves, no matter how many times we do come through on our word, there are going to be moments in time when our promise to do a particular thing will end in disappointment because just situations, circumstances beyond our control, things, things happen that we just, can't, we just can't have any control over, and they, they block us from getting something accomplished that we were trying to get done, and we told somebody we would do. Why does that happen? Well, because we're humans. We have limitations. We aren't able to control every circumstance and situation we face. So no matter how faithful we want to be, um, our humanity is going to fail us at times. On the eve of Jesus' rest in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus told his disciples that before the night was over, they'd all be offended. And Peter said, well, everybody else might, but not me. I mean, I'm, I'm Peter. So um, Jesus told Peter that... <laughs> Before the rooster crows twice in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. And when he heard this, Mark 14 and 31 says to Peter, Spake the more vehemently, if I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. He insisted not only would he not deny Jesus, but he would die for him if it came to that. Only a few short hours later, Peter found himself in a situation he had never anticipated. The pressure around him began to build and his, the heat was turned up and as he stood by the, and, the fire and tried to deflect the questions and the stuff, people gathered around him in the courtyard. You know, I think you're, you're one of the guys who was with him. In a moment of weakness, Peter denied he even knew who Jesus was. And at that third and final denial was punctuated with profanity, only seconds before the sound of the crowing rooster brought him to his senses. In his moment of weakness, Peter's faithfulness faded. But when the Bible tells us God is faithful, we can be certain of this. When pressure squeezed Jesus, he was faithful. When the heat was turned up, he remained faithful. When others were unfaithful to him, even then he remained faithful to them. Nothing challenges the faithfulness of God. John the Revelator gave us a, 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 a picture of the unending faithfulness of our God. Well, in the spirit of the Lord's day, John caught a glimpse of our triumphant Savior, proving that even at the end of time, he'll still be faithful. John wrote in Revelation 19, 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. His faithfulness is going to endure to the end. So God is faithful. Lesson starting next week. Don't miss it.